Welcome back to Goldmark Gallery and another episode of Goldmark TV. We've got a short but sweet episode for you today. First off, new to the gallery this week, our brand new autumn magazine. Now, there are a number of things in here that um, we've shown before on Goldmark TV, but we can uh, show in more detail here, and some things that we've not seen. Um, there's a lovely piece on Julian Trevelyan's printmaking, a little bit about the, uh, the history of, of how he, he, uh, he trained as a printmaker, some of the influences that went into his work. It's nice to see some of his work in juicy detail here. We've got articles on the history of Siena, the colour raw and burnt Siena, through the works of Joe Tilson. This lovely Leonard Rosamond painting, which I think we've showed on Goldmark TV before, has a nice little breakdown of some of the history behind Rosamond's portrait making. A lovely piece on Alan Davies' woodcuts. And a wonderful, wonderful piece by Professor Sebastian Blackie, who's written for us before on the joys of Jean Nicolas' slipware pots. Our Jean Nicolas exhibition is ongoing, and later in this episode, we're going to go upstairs to the uh, exhibition space and we'll take a look at some of his teapots in, in detail. But uh, we've had some, uh, some fantastic comments from visitors to this show. Uh, as you can see, his pottery is a, is a, a riot of colour, so wonderful to eat from, so enriching. So do please, if you haven't yet, uh, book an appointment, come in, see these pots. They really have to be seen in the flesh and handled um, to really appreciate just how, how wonderful they are. And then we've got some work on uh, David Jones' uh, engravings for the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. I think we went over those a couple of uh, weeks ago. There's more detail in here on the history behind uh, these, these very poignant prints and David Jones' own history uh, in the, from the First World War. Lovely piece on a wonderful etching by Henri Matisse there. And finally, a really a romping uh, biography of James Gilray, one of Britain's very greatest cartoonists, one of the greatest cartoonists in the world. I'm looking forward to showing you some of his work in detail in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll be sure to do a, a programme on that. So do, if you want, pick up a copy. Before we go upstairs to have a look at the uh, Jean Nicolas pots, I thought we'd take a look this afternoon at uh, something quite special, these wonderful Dürer woodcuts. Um, these are from The Small Passion, they're one of his great sort of magnum opuses in, in, in printmaking. Something really special, I'm really looking forward to showing you these. This is something quite unusual for the Goldmark Gallery. A lot of the work that we've shown you in the past has been by great European, great British uh, painters and printmakers of the last hundred years. That's the sort of work that we've tended to specialise in. But we have had uh, lots of work from before that time. We've shown you some beautiful, beautiful etchings by uh, Goya from the late 1700s. These prints by Dürer, this small passion, are probably one of the very earliest things that we've ever had the, uh, the fortune to, to have here at the gallery and to be able to, uh, to promote and show. These are uh, prints, woodcut prints, from Dürer's Small Passion. Uh, he made two passions, a small and a larger version. And this is really considered one of his greatest works in the medium of woodcut. We've actually had uh, the first edition of this suite and the second edition. The first edition have now sold out. Um, these are the second edition prints printed from the very same blocks. And as you can see, I only have five here around me. They've been very popular and they've been uh, running out of the gallery for the last, uh, last couple of months. We just realised that we have these very few left and I thought it would be a shame to, to miss out on, on um, bringing them to you today. And so that's why we're having a look at them. Dura was one of the very greatest and the very most popular, uh, very, very best known artists of his generation. He was born in Nuremberg and he would become uh, one of the, the, the greatest known uh, printmakers of his, of his age, of uh, a sort of late Renaissance uh, German uh, uh, artists. He came from a, a very artistic family. His, his, um, his father encouraged him as a, as a draftsman. He had hoped that Dura, the young Dura would become a goldsmith. And you can see some of the, the fine detail work, the very careful sort of deft quality to these prints would have suited him perfectly to that sort of very delicate work in, in, in goldsmithing. But in fact, 
Dura proved a very natural draftsman, a, a hugely natural uh, talent. And he started working as a very young man uh, with his godfather, who was a printer and a, and, a, and a publisher. It was probably in that workshop environment, uh, working on woodcuts himself, cutting the designs of his master, learning the skills of using these tools and, and working to, um, to the demands of, of, of patrons, that Dura really honed his feeling for working in print. In fact, in later years, though he would become a very popular a painter, a, a, an extremely beautiful uh, worker in, on, on, in paint, for a number of years he didn't paint because he was making so much money from his prints. His prints were really the main way that he got his name known, uh, to the point where he was talking with all the greatest artists of his time, conversing with people like Raphael in his letters. The small passion Dura worked on from 1508 to around 1511, um, so right at the sort of very peak of his powers. He had gone to Italy twice uh, as, as a young man, uh, done two sort of almost like gap years, Wanderjahre, as they were known in, in, uh, in German. It was quite typical for an artist to, to travel and learn the, the crafts, the trades, the sort of tricks of, of other artists uh, around the area. He'd been to Italy twice and brought back with him the sort of flavours of, of Venetian painting, of Italian painting, and he brought that and his sort of Gothic German roots together. And that's really what made him such a, a wonderful painter, a wonderful printmaker. The Small Passion was uh, one of his very greatest works, 36 images detailing uh, the life of, of Christ. Quite typical established imagery. Dürer's passion uh, went right to the, uh, to the very start of the story, to the, the fall of, uh, of Adam and Eve, the fall of man uh, in the Garden of Eden, and then some very early scenes from Jesus' life. We have the Annunciation um, and then the Nativity, and also just prior uh, to the story of the Passion, uh, Christ uh, sending out the, the money charges from the temple. The series of images that he made for uh, the Passion, he probably wouldn't have actually cut himself. By now, he was a very established uh, a master painter. He had a, a large workshop of people working for him, working on his paintings, working on prints. They would probably have been responsible for cutting his designs, uh, which he had drawn in pencil. And actually, if you see some of the original designs that he made and compare them to these prints, they are nearly exactly the same. These are almost facsimile works that have been cut into wood here. Having said that, he was an incredibly adept woodcutter, uh, an incredibly adept printmaker. He had learnt uh, from a very young age, honed his skills, and in fact the artists that worked in his workshop, uh, one of them wrote about the, the pitiless tyranny that they served uh, uh, under Dura's watchful eye. He was extremely meticulous, extremely demanding about the quality of the line, the quality of the printing of the blocks. These were produced over three or four years, 1508 to 1511, until they were eventually published and uh, they were one of the, the works that really sort of firmly established him as the great printmaker of his age. Uh, from 1513, for three or four years, he made no paintings, focused purely on print. Because printmaking was relatively cheap compared to painting, it was quite economical, quite efficient. You could print a number of images and have them bound, and books of your prints, your images, would be uh, distributed uh, far and wide. It was a fantastic way, as a Renaissance artist, to really establish your name, to get your popularity, to have your name on the, on the lips of other artists around Europe. And that's precisely what Dura did. These are just five of the images left from this second edition. This was printed a hundred years later from the very same blocks. In fact, virtually the only discernible difference between these prints and the first edition are that on the back of the first edition we had Latin text, and on the back of this second edition, printed in Venice, the very city that Dürer had, uh, had frequented as a young man and which uh, was um, very sort of admiring of his work. On the backs of these second edition prints, you'll find Italian rather than Latin text. That's really what sets them apart. That detail aside, they are virtually exactly the same in quality, the quality of the line, the quality of the printing. And it's absolutely beautiful to think that these prints have survived some 500 years to get to us now in this wonderful quality is, is really astonishing. It's a really fantastic uh, chance to be able to show you uh, some of these images. 
These five that are left uh, include actually some of my favourites. I've got here uh, the Agony of the Garden. It's a really beautiful image of a very poignant moment in the Passion of uh, Christ praying uh, the idea of his, uh, his spirit being willing but the flesh being weak, praying before uh, the, the final act of the, of the crucifixion. Uh, he's kneeling here in the Garden of Gethsemane. The way that Dürer manages to, to capture these wonderful sort of crumpled, curved lines in, in the cloth, which you'll see in a, a number of these prints, is really beautiful and very difficult to do in wood. Um, his assistants really must have been working uh, very, um, very hard to, to get some of these lines out in, in the wood. But really what separates Dürer's compositions from other passions of the time is his fundamental understanding of the composition of the prints. He has a really sort of profound uh, knowledge of how to work uh, depending on the scale uh, of his blocks, of his, of his panels. So in these small passion uh, images, the whole composition has this wonderful sort of compact tightness, this is wonderful motion between the different elements. And he knew expertly how to contrast the clearer patches uh, like these on the cloth here and up here in these clouds with the darker, richer tones of, of lines. So you can see here this wonderful dark sky and these shadows around Christ and his apostles. And here, just in the distance, the town with some guardsmen standing outside. You'll also notice in each one of these prints, Dürer's monogram. You can see it just hidden down here in the shadows here. It's a little clearer on some of these other images. So here we have the resurrection down here on this stone here, the A and the D, Albrecht Dürer. One of the earliest and most recognisable monograms in Western art. The images that we have remaining here, the agony in the garden, the resurrection, the lamentation, doubting Thomas, very famous scene, the supper at Emmaus, some of the later images from the Passion. You can see in pieces like the agony in the garden and this wonderful scene of the lamentation, this beautiful sense of, of bringing multiple figures together, multiple elements. That's really what typifies a lot of Renaissance painting, a lot of Renaissance art, particularly later Renaissance art like Dürer's. This uh, wonderful sense of setting these different elements apart and giving them the depth uh, that's the sort of great change from early uh, painting uh, and, and the, the sort of um, the enlightened uh, uh, perspective of Renaissance painting. There's something really quite touching about these images and I think that's partly down to the scale. You can imagine, well imagine, um, a set of these 36 images being passed around originally bound in a book, people would have had quite an intimate experience turning through those pages and seeing these designs and you can, you can well imagine someone really warming uh, to, the, to the effects of, of, of Dürer's art, um, really getting a feel for that kind of, that, that quite personal touch in what was a very iconic, established, founding story uh, in, in Western Christendom. I particularly like in these images and this is the case across the, uh, the, the suite, across this, this series of, of woodcuts. The way that Dürer is always bringing our attention back to Christ, back to the central figure in this story. If you look, for example, in this wonderful scene, the way that the, the shade, the shadows in this room and this sort of haloed effect around Christ's head are really drawing us towards his face and his figure, this sort of central figure down the middle of the print or over here in the Lamentation, it's got this wonderful kind of circular movement of these people congregating around Christ's body, this wonderful kind of motion in what is actually quite a sort of still, static uh, and poignant moment in the Passion. These are, as I said, the last five that we have uh, available. And as these are second edition prints, these are much more affordable than, than the first edition, which we've already had. Um, is, this is really a, a, a fantastic opportunity, um, if you've liked seeing some of these prints, to own something by one of the great masters in, in Western art. 
a, a really wonderful chance we've had to, to handle these and to, to get to know them a bit. And really, this is the, um, the last chance for you uh, before they all disappear to, to have a look at them, which is why I thought we'd focus on them today. I hope you've enjoyed seeing them. I hope this is something that you maybe hadn't expected from us. It's a wonderful series of prints, uh, one of my favourite that we've had here, uh, and it's been, uh, it's been wonderful to, to give them just this little moment uh, in today's episode. So here we are back upstairs again in the midst of our Jean-Nicolas Gérard show in this exhibition space upstairs. It seems a long time since we've had another film where we've got a load of pots out like this on a, on a, a table to show you. We were really spoilt for choice on different forms to focus on today from this show. There's some beautiful work in a number of different shapes and sizes here. Jean-Nicolas bottles have proved very popular. Uh, we've got some wonderful soup tureens with those fantastic bobble hat lids some lovely whimsical dishes and those fantastic square dishes which you would have seen uh, last week when Mike was doing uh, his walkthrough of the exhibition. But as we've been walking around and taking a look and, and seeing what's catching our eye, we all agreed that it would be nice to spend some time with these wonderful teapots that jean Nicola has provided us with. These have all come straight from the south of France, from Valençol in Provence where jean Nicola lives but they've also spent a bit of time with a lovely lady who lives in a village nearby us, uh, who's a basket weaver, and I think grows her own willow. And she's been uh, very busy putting these new handles on these, uh, all these new teapots that we've got here. So we've been, uh, we've been keeping her, her hands at work recently. I wanted to show these teapots because they're quite different from a lot of potter's teapots. And the teapot really, um, particularly for beginner potters, is the sort of climax point of, of learning how to put a pot together. It's almost the ultimate challenge for a domestic ware potter. A teapot presents so many challenges in the, in the many parts that it has, in the, the forming of a lid, a spout, a body and a handle, but also the fact that you are contending with the, the physics, the mechanics of water. A teapot has to work. You have to get your measurements, you have to get your, uh, your component parts to fit together right for your teapot to work. There's a lot of finesse, a lot of, um, of understanding how pots work, how pots will work in the firing. And that's really brought to bear in these wonderful teapots around me here today. We've got a little setup here with a number of different teapots of different sizes, different shapes, showing off just how jean Nicolas' work really varies hugely from pot to pot. You'll see sort of round, uh, round shapes here, some squarer sides. I love these little lids. jean Nicolas really uh, uh, loves sort of these little whimsical uh, additions to pots. So you'll see some of these handles have got little sort of bobble hats, a little bit like those soup tureens that we saw uh, earlier in our, our walkthrough. Um, but also these little sort of almost abstract shape, squared off and, and diagonal uh, little blocks of clay. I think a really lovely touch from jean Nicola, and again, very tactile, uh, very easy to use with these little finger and thumb dimples either side. Really, this component work that a teapot involves, uh, making these different parts that come together, that suits the way that jean Nicola has been working recently. Uh, you might have seen, a couple of weeks ago, we put up our, our new interview with Jean Nicola that was filmed earlier this summer. And he spoke about how, particularly with things like his vases, his bottles, he's enjoyed going back to the wheel and throwing things uh, and making things in multiple parts, uh, throwing some things and then adding things with, with coiling afterwards. Something about interrupting the natural rhythm of throwing on the wheel, of, of um, sort of moving away from the, 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 the uh, the cadences of working on a wheel uh, and, and disrupting that rhythm of working, that pattern of working, means that the pots end up with this sort of quite whimsical feel, uh, never quite sure how a shoulder is going to finish off, finish off a pot or, or a base is going to be finished. That element of surprise, of sort of um, catching yourself off guard almost as a potter, particularly after so many years of working through and, and establishing a kind of vocabulary, a, a, a vocabulary of, of working, of a, a palette of glazes. It's been enjoyable for him, I think, to explore some of those surprises, 
particularly given that Jean Nicolet is the potter for whom there are no accidents. It's uh, anything that happens uh, is, is accepted and, and worked into the making of a pot. So I think that's, that's nice to, to think about when we look at some of these teapots, these different various shapes and sizes. Now, as I just mentioned, teapots present a, a wonderful challenge to the potter. There's all sorts of things that can go very wrong very quickly. For example, throwing a little spout on the wheel, that spout will remember that sort of torqued movement that's moved the clay into that shape. So that sort of twisting can be undone as the pot is firing. So uh, how the spout is affixed to the pot and how it's cut off uh, to make its, its lip here at the front, that has to be taken into consideration, how the pot is going to change from uh, being a sort of wet clay as it then starts to harden, to dry, and then of course when it's fired again uh, and the firing draws more moisture out of it and that shape changes again. jean Nicola is a potter who has said before uh, in past videos in our, in our first interview with him that he's not interested in technique. You can only really have that kind of attitude, that wonderful freedom, when you've built that foundation of technique yourself, when you've been able to move past that. And I think that's shown in these wonderful pots here. If I take this teapot, for example, which I made some tea in not half an hour ago, uh, we're going to give a little, a little pour test now just to see uh, how um, jean Nicolas pots, which look crude, they look um, sort of put together with a, with a wonderful freedom, a wonderful sort of laissez-faire attitude can still hold up to, to any sort of elegant porcelain teapot that you might imagine uh, when, you hear the, when you hear the word. Uh, so I'm just going to pour a little cup of tea into one of these beakers. I think jean Nicolas teapots work really well together with his, uh, his beakers, um, with these lovely platters that we've got out here. I can well imagine a, a slice of cake off one of these or, or a little tea gathering with, these, um, with lots of these beakers around. What I think is really shown in these, in these works is the, the, the sort of the pure joy that jean Nicolas has for pottery. You'll see all of the hallmarks of his work. You'll see these wonderful scraffito lines scratched around the different parts, across the lid, across the body. You'll see a number of the different colours of slips that we've got here. So there's this wonderful rich yellow, but there's also this beautiful cobalt blue, which really sort of shines when it's laid over this yellow underneath. Uh, we've got that rich, warm black, uh, and some of this raw clay as well around the, around the, uh, the neck of the, the pot, always reminding us that the clay that jean is working with, this earthenware clay, is the same earth that feeds the countryside where he lives, same earth that gives us our food, just as these pots can sort of feed the soul, uh, especially tea, I think, uh, from one of these wonderful teapots, a very warming uh, and enriching experience. One of the important things about teapots is weight and size. A teapot's got to be big enough to hold enough tea to make it worthwhile having, worthwhile uh, to serve tea amongst friends or family. But it's also not going to be heavy enough that when you fill it with that tea, it's going to break your wrist trying to pick it up. Um, you can see even in this quite small teapot amongst these other ones of John Nicholas, plenty of space in here for tea, um, more than enough room for tea for four or five. Um, I've got a beaker full here. Not heavy at all. John Nicola really understands uh, the fundamentals of pottery and that's why he's able to, to work in this wonderful loose way. I think often people forget that he has that prowess behind him, he has that technical proficiency. Uh, it's very easy to sort of dismiss his work as, as childlike maybe, but there's a real understanding of how pots work, uh, which is why teapots like these, uh, with their wonderful sense of whimsy and lopsidedness, still work. I particularly enjoy the different rhythms of these pots. The way that, from a single form, as he does with his beakers, with his square dishes, with his plates and platters, jean Nicol is able to find those different natural rhythms as the clay is forming on the wheel, as he's coiling a piece, that take you in different directions. I love how some of these teapots are, are quite squat. They sort of sit heavy on their base while others have a kind of ballooning roundness to them. They have a, a wonderful sort of um, uplifting curve uh, to their body. I'm thinking perhaps something like this larger teapot here. 
and how that wonderful round shape is finished off by its little bobble hat lid. I like also the little cut off pieces from these lips here, which is very traditional. There's something so sort of um, warming and rustic about these, these teapots. You can see how, how sort of happily they get along on this table. And I can well imagine uh, sitting for tea with people with a, a teapot and four or five beakers, uh, a couple of plates out for, for food. I hope you've enjoyed seeing some of these different forms, seeing the different variations that Jean-Nicola gets in just a, a, single, a single shape. I hope to show you a few more of Jean-Nicola's different uh, types of pots over the next coming weeks. Uh, I'm sure we'll be looking at some of these wonderful bottles, vases, there's more to come still. But we're really delighted that this has been such a successful show. We've had uh, more than 200 pots now uh, have found new homes. But there's plenty of work still here, plenty of fantastic teapots. As the winter months creep in, as it gets colder, uh, bitter outside, as the rain starts to fall, I strongly recommend, string, strongly welcome you to, uh, to bring some of Jean Nicolas' uh, sunny Valençon slipwear. Uh, bring some summer, bring some warmth, uh, bring some joy into these cold months as they come ahead. I'll see you again soon.